Thank you, Trio, for saying this morning, and thank you for the amens. Now, I think all of you probably need to uh, honk your horn in order for us to hear your amen, unless your name is Dave Fulton. All right, thank you, thank you. Well, it is a joy to be here and to see each of you this morning. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of the hard work uh, that has gone into getting this set up. Uh, a full crew back behind us. Uh, they have the door down, so you can't see uh, most of them. But uh, they're there. We've had people here all day yesterday and some every day this week, literally trying to uh, just make sure that things were working. And uh, I think uh, the wind has the greatest effect on us. Uh, if, if I cut out or if a mic cuts out, that's because the wind is is playing with our various many connections that we have around here. Uh, if you can hear me well, s honk your horn. All right. All right, very good, very good. All right, I'll take that as a yes. All right, well, thank you again for being here. This is Mother's Day, and we want to honor our mothers, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers, and all of those who have had the role of being a mentor to younger people, those of you ladies who have invested your life, perhaps not even in your own children, uh, but in other people who uh, you have played that role as a mother or a grandmother, we appreciate you. I'm going to read throughout this uh, sermon this morning uh, a few different scriptures, but I want to begin in this way. The boldest and most courageous adventure that a woman can undertake is to become a mother. It is bold because it brings into this world, this very troubled world, a never dying eternal soul. That is a sobering thought. That is a bold thing to do. It is bold because it supposes that one would have the ability to nourish and to cherish a fragile life from a new birth and somehow coax that child into adulthood to become a responsible adult. Every mother dreams of that but never really understands exactly what that means until she's a mother. It is also courageous because it requires a mother to raise someone who is so much like her. And I would say the same thing for us fathers. It requires us to raise little ones who reflect us. We, it's like looking into a mirror for our children to show us our own flaws and our own blemishes. Being a parent is not merely casting a shadow that mimics our every move or is always at our side, following close behind our footsteps. But it's more like a shadow that we give a, a body and a mind and most of all a will to. And suddenly that shadow is no longer just standing by our side and mimicking our behavior and walking behind us every moment. Suddenly, it seems to have taken on a life of its own, and before long, our children are quite apart from who we are in their being. And yet, this adventure of motherhood that we celebrate today, it's part of God's great plan for creation. For he said in Genesis chapter 1, he said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He spoke those words just a few days before the creation of man when he told the fish to, to multiply after their kind. He told the birds to multiply after their kind and to fill the air. He told the animals of the land to multiply after their kind and to fill the earth. And then he told human beings to multiply after his likeness. After his likeness. You see, it's not only presumptive for us to imagine that we can successfully raise another person to a healthy life, someone who reflects us, but that task is heightened by the prospect that God has given to us the ability to reproduce someone 
after His likeness. Our children are not primarily in our likeness. They're in God's likeness. What a sobering thought. Now it's normal to look at a newborn and to exclaim how their eyes look like mom's eyes, their nose looks like dad's nose, their, their ears look like grandma's, or some other feature looks like grandpa or brother or sister. Doc, a doctor or a family member may come in, and I, I would imagine that no one here yet has ever heard these words from a doctor or a loved one when they see a newborn child and they exclaim, my, look how much she looks like God. And yet that is exactly what every child born into this world resembles. For God says that when we have children, they resemble Him. They bear His image even before they bear our own. So God has entrusted to fallen, fallible, humanity with this immense and incomprehensible responsibility of bearing children, bearing offspring in His image. What this tells me is that there are no mistakes. God so, so superintends the creation of life that never in the his, history of baby making has there ever been a creature born bearing the likeness and the image of the most glorious, all-wise, and beautiful God whom God called a mistake. Oh, sure, from a human perspective, we've heard those words before. A child that was, quote, unintended, a mistake, a surprise, not in God's eyes. God makes no mistakes. Nothing surprises God. And every child that you as a mother or a grandmother as a woman has had the privilege to take into your arms and to comfort and to correct or to, or to bring into this world, that child bears the image of our Almighty God. Author Mitch Albaum says that behind every story is a mother's story. But I think it goes back farther than that. Behind every story is God's story. The story of human life doesn't begin with a mother or a father, but it begins with God himself. For there is something of the divine role that every father and every mother carries out. It's a creative role. It's a comforting role. And it is a correcting role. Let me just mention these three roles here for the next few minutes. The creative role. When God found Adam and Eve, He found them quite unclothed in the garden, having just eaten from the tree which He had forbidden them to eat. It was no ordinary meal. It was not God's provision. It was the forbidden fruit. It was the fare of hell. God asked, What have you done. Yet God did not turn aside from His plan, but in doing out the consequence for sin, and doling out the consequences for sin, He did not remove from fallen, fallible humanity the original mandate to be a father or a mother. Instead, He declared to Eve, our first mother, that the fruit of human conception through which humans multiply and fill the earth will now be multiplied with agony. He says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and in pain you shall bring forth children. Then to Adam, he turned and God increased his labor, and he removed from him the prospect of immortality. And these words, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground out from which you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. Nonetheless, get this, nonetheless, despite the awfulness of his sin, God did not remove from Adam and from Eve the role and the responsibility of bringing into this world children who bear the image of himself, of God. For in Genesis chapter 9, 
Well after the fall of Adam and Eve, again, God declares to humanity, be fruitful and multiply and increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. The task has become daunting. Foul, fallen, fallible human beings bringing into the world more fallen and fallible human beings. Think about that. And yet, this pleases God. For from the creative role of fallen woman will come her Savior, who is greater than all of the fallenness and all of the fallibility of humanity. So as, sober, as sobering as a thought as it is to imagine that bearing children in our own likeness is, much more should, have, should our thoughts be that this child bears the likeness of God. The creative role of a mother it is a concurring role. That means not only does her child resemble her in physical features, but more deeply imprinted upon that child is the reflection of God. Eve recognized her own creative role. She said these words when Cain was born, her firstborn. She declared, I have begotten a man with the help of the Lord. She recognized that given her fallen condition, it's only by the grace of God that she was able to bring in a new, another child, another human being into this world were it not for God. Sarah, the mother of Isaac, when she had a son, this was said by God, I will bless her and I will give Abraham a son by her. I will bless her and she will become nations. You see a mother... A father, we can't create children apart from the providence of God. It is the grace of God. And so the first role of a mother is to bring in a child in the likeness of God into this world. That's a creative role. And can I say that God shares that creative role, for it is a miracle of God. Secondly, the comforting role. Oddly enough, the example of the comforting role comes from a mother who bore a child, also bore a child to Abraham. Her name was Hagar. Following the birth of Isaac in Genesis 21, Hagar and her teenage son are sent packing into the wilderness and under the heat of the sun and exhaustion of the desert, Hagar takes her young teenage son, places him under a desert shrub, and he leaves him there to die, for they had not had water, they had not food, and there they were scorching and dying underneath the desert sun. And in that moment, Hagar, a mother, places her son under that shrub brush, and she removes herself off to a distance, and she says these words, lest I should have to watch my son die. You know, you say, Pastor Fry, what's that have to do with the comforting role of a mother? That doesn't sound like comfort. That sounds like abandonment. And some of you here know what abandonment from a parent looks like or feels like. Yes, this story begins with a mother, Hagar, who abandons her only son. Leaves him to die on his own. But there, under the desert sun, there is God. And the voice of God is heard by Hagar as she finds her own desert shrub under which to hide and shade herself. And God says to Hagar, Get up! Get up! And go lift up your boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Now, if you're a mother today, I don't know what your relationship is with your children, but you may find yourself in the sort of place where you may relate with Hagar. You're far from your children. Maybe you need to hear the voice of God that says, Get up! Go and wrap your arms around your child. Maybe you're a mother who feels more like Ishmael, whose mother has placed you under a scrub brush in the desert and has just abandoned you. Can I tell you something? God looks out for Ishmael. And God tells Hagar, get up. Come out from underneath that bush. And go and find a well 
where I will point you and fill your skin, fill your bottle with water and take care of your son. This image of a mother banning her own son in the desert heat is a sobering thought for Hagar herself was in an exhausted state. She had lost her sense of duty to her offspring. She had turned to protecting herself instead of protecting her child until God intervened. But then again, we see here a mother's comforting role that concurs with God's role. You see, not only does a mother have a creative role apart from God, God is, is active in the creation of every human being, so is God active in the comfort of every human being. Every comforting touch that a mother can give is a touch from God. A mother's comforting role concurs with God's comforting role. It was God who pointed Hagar to the well. It was God who told her to get up and to comfort Ishmael. It was God who told Hagar to provide water from the well to her son Ishmael. There's a reason why a child, young child, who has hurt himself, wants his mother. Because no one cares and no one comforts more than a mother. And that comfort reflects something of God himself. And then finally, our correcting role. This third role that the mother has reflects also the image of God. It's a corrective role, and despite the reality that most children would rather be corrected by their mother than their father. Each parent has the responsibility to train and as necessary to correct their children. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 11 and 12 applies to fathers and mothers. When the proverb writer writes, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. And so here are some point, points to consider regarding correction. Number one, correction must always be couched with care. Number two, correction must always be concerned with clarity. Clarity not only of what the wrong has been, but what right is to follow. Correction third must be coupled with control. This is how God corrects us. Again, the corrective role of a father and a mother concurs just as a creative role and the comforting role, so does our corrective role concur with God's loving, gracious correction in our lives. All of these roles concur with the role of God Himself. In conclusion, I want to read this prayer, the prayer for parents. Prayer to our Heavenly Father. It says this, Heavenly Father, from whom all parenthood comes. Teach us so to understand our children that they may grow in your wisdom and love according to your holy will. Fill us with sensitive respect for the great gift of human life which you have committed to our care. Help us to listen with patience to their worries and to their problems and give us the tolerance to allow them to develop in the likeness of your Son, for the glory of God, and for their eternal salvation. Amen. Amen. God, help us, as fathers and mothers, to carry out our role of not only bringing children into this world in the creative role, but of comforting and of correcting and training our children to love to serve Jesus with all their heart. I'm going to ask Pastor Davis to come forward and uh, Miss Janice uh, Cooper, where, where's uh, Janice? All right. We have two gift cards and we have two plants. Is that correct? Janice, you have, oh, they have, okay. Pastor Davis, can you bring those out here? And then,